right. I'm going to talk to you all tonight about the, the faith of Christ. And it's probably, may not be very long, it might be a very basic message, but uh, you got, you got, sometimes you got to preach the basics. Yeah. You got to preach the fundamentals sometimes. At the, the faith of, of Jesus Christ uh, really is not a subject that a lot of churches, churches teach on today. There's two reasons for that. Number one is because Christians try to establish their own righteousness. Yeah. Look at Romans 10, 3. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Now, who is God's righteousness? Because God's righteousness is a person. Look at the next verse. For who Christ. is the end of the law for righteousness? For uh, to everyone that believeth. Now, God's righteousness personified is Jesus Christ. Yeah. But what makes God's righteousness manifest to us? Look at Romans chapter 3. Um, where, where am I? What verse am I? Oh, okay, 20, 22. Oh, yeah, you're right, 21. 321. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. So the righteousness of God is made manifest by Christ's faith. And what does that mean? Well, that means Christ had a faith in God's Word and He lived by it every day of His life yeah. when He was on this earth. So most Christians just think you need faith just to be saved and that's it. That's all they, they think you need faith for. No, you need, faith, you need to be justified by the faith of Christ and then you need to live your Christian life out by the faith of, that, of, faith of Christ also. Faith doesn't, doesn't just stop for you to be saved. You have to walk by faith. You know, p people quote that verse, for we walk by faith, not by sight. The verse didn't say you're justified by faith. He's talking about the walk there. Yeah. You walk by faith. Now, number one is because uh, because Christians try to establish their own righteousness. But number two, the uh, reason why it's not taught in churches today is because churches are teaching from the wrong Bible. There's only one Bible on this earth that has that phrase, the, the phrase, the faith of Jesus Christ in all the right places. Amen. Now, there's one exception to that. Uh, the exception is the New King James Bible. Or, well, I shouldn't say Bible, I should say New King James Version. But even that one doesn't have it in all the right places that it should. But the reason why the New King James Version doesn't have it in all the places that it should is because it was translated by a bunch of egotistical, self-righteous, bigoted thieves and liars who's trying to steal your book. Yeah. Uh, this is what the tra that they profess, the translators of the New King James Version profess that they translated from the Masoretic text from the old, uh, of the Old Testament and the Texas Receptus of the New Testament. Uh, Arthur Forrestad, on the New King James Version, said this, he said the New King James Version is a conservative revision of the King James Version that does not make any alterations on the basis of a revised Greek or Hebrew text, but adheres to the readings presumed to underlie the King James Version. Okay, we'll see if it's true. Get Galatians 3.16 in one hand. Get Galatians 3.16 in one hand and get Genesis 22.17 in the other. Oh, 
All right. Now I'm going to read the New King James Version. You just read along in, in your Bible there. First will be in Galatians. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. Okay? Now look in Genesis 22. Keep in mind, he said, he does not say, and to seeds, as of many. Genesis 22. Blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. You know where the word descendants is not found? It's not found in any text that underlines the King James Bible. They lied. The word seed, and I don't know Hebrew or Greek, but it ain't hard to Google this stuff to figure out that they're liars. The word seed in a King James Bible is this word right here. I looked this up on, this is Strong's Concordance. So if this ain't true, then they're lying, so you might as well just throw that out also. Zaraka, I guess is how you say it. It means literally seed, like a seed you put in the ground. But it can also be translated seed as in like someone's lineage. You know about words found? Look at Deuteronomy 11. Deuteronomy 11, verse... Uh, does verse 8 start with, Therefore you shall keep every commandment or something like that? Yeah. All right. Deuteronomy 11, 8. I'm reading the New King James. Therefore you shall keep every commandment which I command you today, that you may be strong and go in and possess the land which you cross over to possess and that you may prolong your days in the land which the Lord swore to give to your fathers, to them and their descendants. That's not Zaraka there when he says descendants. A land flowing with milk or honey, milk and honey, for the land which you go to possess is not like the land of Egypt from which you have come, where you sowed your seed and watered it by foot as a vegetable garden. When he said he sowed your seed... That word showed up right there in Deuteronomy 11.10. Uh, 11, you know where else it showed up? It showed up back in Genesis 22, and they translated it descendants. Why'd they do that? The word descendants was right there in Deuteronomy 11.10 or 9, and they didn't. that word wasn't Zarka. You know where the word descendants is found in Genesis 22.17? It's found in the RSV of 1885 where they publicly said that they were translating from Alexandrian manuscripts. Yeah. That means Arthur Forstead lied. Those are, the Alexandrian manuscripts are not manuscripts King James was translated from. You said, what does that have to do with, it, with the faith of Christ? Well, it has to do with the issue that you have a, a corrupt Bible translation tr changing one word in a verse. And if you don't think one, one word can change doctrine, you're crazy. Yeah. It does change doctrine. The promise of multiplying the seed in Genesis 22 wasn't given to the 12 tribes. It was given to Jesus Christ. That's what Paul said in Galatians 3. Yeah. See, the, the New King James, I didn't even have to compare it to any other version. It lied within its own contents. Yeah. Now, we, we were in Romans 3... Again, go back to Romans 3 again. We'll read the same verse. Because not only do they... And by the way, they, they also criticize King James translators for doing the same thing that they did, which is not translating the word the same way every single time because they didn't do it that way either. Um, 
So one word can change doctrine. Now look at Romans 3, verse 21 again. I'm going to read from the New King James. One word is about to change this whole passage. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and, upon, and on all who believe, for there is no difference. Now how many of you believe God's righteousness outside of the law is revealed by your faith? I mean, the Bible says we are the children of God by our faith in Christ Jesus, but that does not mean that we manifest God's righteousness by our faith. Right. We're only declared righteous by the faith of Jesus Christ. Amen. And when He imputes that faith of Christ to us, then we're made the child of God by our faith. Well, really, the, the other issue is uh, men can read the same verses you just read in your version, King James Bible, and somehow they still come away with the understanding that the New King James just told you. Yeah. They, they still think God's righteousness without the law is manifested by their faith in Jesus Christ because they don't know what the faith of Christ is. It's not made manifest by my faith or your faith. It's made manifest by the faith of Jesus Christ. And people have a, they, they struggle with that because, you know, I've had multiple people tell me that Christ didn't need faith because Christ is God and God doesn't need faith. We're talking about a man here. We're not talking about the deity part of Jesus Christ. Amen. Look at Revelation 19. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. Do you believe Jesus Christ pleased the Father? He said He did. And guess what? He needed faith to do that. Otherwise, He's operating outside of the, the Word of God, which He was the Word of God in flesh. In Revelation 19.11, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called what? I mean, that would be a stupid thing to call yourself if you were a being or somebody who never even needed faith. Why would you call yourself faithful? A, a, a hypocrite is someone who professes to have something that he doesn't actually have. And like Paul just said, faithful means full of faith. So you mean to tell me that Jesus Christ named himself full of faith and he really didn't have any faith at all? I mean, that, 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 that kind of stuff comes from... Man's own uh, reasoning of the Scripture. And they're leaning to their own understanding. Look at, uh, look at Revelation chapter 2. You say, well, I don't understand the, Bi understand the Bible. Don't, don't worry about understanding the Bible yet. You just believe what it says. You'll figure out what it's saying later. Revelation 2.13, he says, I know thy works, and this is Jesus Christ talking. If you had any doubt, they're red letters. I know thy works, and where thou, uh, thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest my name, and hast not denied what? My faith. There it is. My faith. He didn't need faith. He didn't need a name either. Now, number one, look at... Uh, Look at Romans chapter 1. Amen. Number 1, the faith of Jesus Christ manifests the righteousness of God. You're preaching my first message in the field. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is, like I said, it's basic. It's, these are the basics. Uh, Romans 1.16 For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. The righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel of Christ. That's what he just said. Now, how does that gospel start out? Well, look at verse 18. The wrath of God is against the reprobation of man. 
That's basically all the way, the, the issue all the way to the end of the chapter is the reprobation of man. So God declares men ungodly and unrighteous because they wouldn't retain Him in their knowledge. Yeah. Then look at Romans chapter 2. The gospel of Christ continues in Romans 2 here where God's admonition towards man about his reprobate, reprobation is revealed. Now here's the admonition is this in verse 6. Who will render to every man according to his deeds to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life? There's only ever been one man on this earth that ever achieved that. Amen. It ain't me and it ain't you. It's Jesus Christ. So you believe Jesus Christ received eternal life? Yes. That's what the Bible says. Let me tell you something, man. God the Father said to His Son, Now, Son, I want you to go into this world and fulfill the righteousness of my law, and I want you to die for the whole world's sins, and don't worry about being in hell, because there's a verse over there in Psalm 16 that says, I won't leave your soul there. You know what Jesus Christ said today? He said, Amen, Holy Father. He had faith. That's the faith of Jesus Christ. And you know what happened when He did that? He got glory, honor, immortality, and eternal life. Amen. So where'd you get that from? Look at Romans 6. I didn't make that stuff up. Look at Romans 6, 8. Uh, now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over Him, for in that He died, He died unto sin how many times? Once. But in that He liveth, He liveth unto God. A scripture with scripture. Jesus Christ got eternal life. He doesn't die anymore. Yeah. Because He died unto sin once. Because He obeyed the Father. That is the manifestation of the righteousness of God right there. That Christ walked by faith in what God said, His Father said, and lived a life pleasing unto the Father by believing what God said about Him even unto death. And He died that death believing that God would raise Him from the dead. But He also died that death because He knew that it would grant the sons of Adam the same gift that they trusted in it. That's the reason why He did it. So number two, the faith of Jesus Christ justifies the believer unto eternal life. Look at uh, Galatians chapter 2. This is what the Apostle Paul declared in Galatians 2.16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by what? Faith. The faith of who? Jesus. Jesus Christ. Now pay attention. Um, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ yeah. and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So believers are justified by Christ's faith, not theirs. You believe in Jesus Christ so that you could be justified by the faith of Jesus Christ. Amen. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. This was something given to you by God. Yeah. Ephesians 2.8 for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The gift in the verse is referring to the word faith. And we're not talking about what Calvin believed about it. We're talking about God granting unto us the gift of righteousness when we trusted in His Son. Now get, look at Ephesians 6. I'm going to give you the definition of righteousness here. Look at Ephesians 6 and get 1 Thessalonians 5. So the, the verse in Ephesians 2, the faith being referred to, there's the faith of Christ, right? Yes. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> By God's grace through Christ's faith, the, 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 not of works. The righteousness of God declared all, uh, demanded all of our condemnation. 
Exactly. Without the, fruit, without the faith of Christ, there would have been no gift of righteousness. Yep. Ephesians 6 and 1 Thessalonians 5. Right, we're going to read Ephesians 6 first. 6 14. Uh, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. You see it? It's the breastplate of righteousness. Now here's how the Apostle Paul defined righteousness in his epistles. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 7. Well, actually, verse 8. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of what? That's what righteousness is. In two passages, the Apostle Paul defined what righteousness is. It's faith and love. So that means when God saved you, He made you His righteousness. And he made, when He made you His righteousness, He made you someone who possesses the faith and love that Christ had towards the Father. And the man that has that faith and has that love towards the Father is a righteous man. That's what God made you positionally. Now look at, uh, look at 2 Corinthians 5. This is how the thing works. The way this transaction works is like this in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. When you believe on Jesus Christ, God takes the body of the sins of your flesh and puts it back on the cross with Christ. And in return, He gives you Christ's resurrected life and gives it to you. And this is how God gives you the gift of Christ's faith or His righteousness. This is what we call positional righteousness. So your position now, if you've believed on Jesus Christ, your position now is alive unto God to be a servant of righteousness. It's in Romans chapter 6. Yeah. And when we're dealing with salvation, your justification is always in reference to the positional standing that you have in Jesus Christ. And that is forgiveness of sins, you're the Son of God, you're seated at the right hand of God, and you have a newness of life and a newness of spirit. And because we are justified, we now have eternal life positionally. Look at Romans chapter 7. You say, I don't feel like it. It doesn't matter how you feel. It's what does the Bible say about it is, is the main issue. Yeah. Romans 7 verse 1. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. Verse 2, For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the, if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. And look at verse 4. Wherefore, brethren, <clears throat> uh, wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. So Christ has been raised now, and you've been joined to him. And you're joined to him as long as he liveth. And Romans chapter 6 told you he didn't die anymore. That means you don't die anymore if you believe if you believed on Jesus Christ. Christ died once, never to die again. That's the same, that's the same position for a believer. And that's what the faith of Christ when it's imputed to you, that's the thing that you get is eternal life. Now look, at, look back at Galatians chapter 2 again. Because this is also what the, the, the faith of Jesus Christ does. It justifies you and gives you a, 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 the greatest positional standing you could have before God, but it also sanctifies you and gives you uh, a life to live now as a believer. We read 2.16, but here's what Paul said in 2.20, in Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, 
I live by what? Who loved me and gave himself for me. Now the word sanctification means to be set apart. So God has positionally set us apart from our sins and has made us a new creature in Christ, but sanctification is not solely a positional issue. Sanctification is something that's got to be, it's also a practical issue. It has to be manifested in your life. Like Paul said in 2 Corinthians 6, come out from among them. That's a commandment. You might, be call, you might be come out from among them positionally, but he's telling a bunch of Corinthians come out from among them. Be ye separate, saith the Lord, and I will receive you. And see, when Paul's talking there in Galatians chapter 2, he is not talking about his justification in verse 20. He's talking about the life he now lives. He's talking about living, and he lives now by the, life, by the faith of Jesus Christ. So he lived the Christian life by the principle of righteousness, which is faith and love. Now does Romans 1.17 make more sense? Have we, where we started? Where it says, the just shall live by faith. Now here's how people, have re, here's how people read the verse. This is how people read Romans 1.17. This is how they read it. The ungodly shall be saved from hell by their faith. It's the way they read it. That ain't what the verse said. It's talking about justified people living by faith. Because the end of the gospel of Christ brings you from being a reprobate to somebody who is being led of the Spirit and being called a son of God in his action. And he's living that, he's living that life by the faith of Jesus Christ. See, the revelation of, God's, of, of the righteousness of God extends beyond the reality of your justification. Yeah. And like I just said, Paul in Romans ends up talking about your sanctification that saves you from the motions of your sins in your body. That's how far that gospel goes. It doesn't just stop at your faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Everything that happened on the cross becomes manifest in your mortal flesh. Jesus Christ died to sin. Okay, you believe it. Now, through the power of Christ, you'll die to sin. That's the way it works. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, so when you believe that, okay. Now, now that you believe that, the Word of God quickens your mortal body. So you can be raised. It, it goes farther than just positional truth. Look at Philippians chapter 3. Paul talked about this same principle in another passage. And it's in Philippians chapter 3. The gospel of Christ is about our justification, sanctification, and glorification because of what He did in those three days and nights. I look at Philippians 3, 4. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other uh, man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Now, a lot of people don't have really an idea what Paul's even talking about here. They think he's talking about his salvation experience. This is not Paul talking about his salvation experience. Right. Paul's talking about how he now lives so that he may attain to a mark for the prize. So when Paul was saved, his flesh didn't automatically change. And who Paul was in the flesh didn't automatically change. He said, what happened? Well, look at verse 7. He made a conscious decision. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. He made a decision right there. As a saved man. And I call that stuff the sevenfold perfection of the flesh there. Everything he listed down, there's seven of them. And not one of those things uh, even compared to the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. 
Now, he, he come, made a conscious decision to throw away everything he was in the flesh, and it was for the, the purpose in verse 8. For the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. So Paul, through the power of Jesus Christ, sanctified himself from who he was in the flesh to know Christ, to win Christ, and be found in Christ. By what principle? Look back in verse 9. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through what? Faith of Christ. Faith of Christ. The righteousness which is of God by faith. Not his own righteousness. It's by the faith of Jesus Christ. Paul looked at Christ, and he looked at himself, and what he saw when he looked at Christ was this. Look back in Philippians 2. This is what he saw. So he lists out his sevenfold perfection there. Then when he looked at Christ, this is what he saw. Philippians 2, 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is about every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So Paul looked at himself and he looked at Christ, and this is what he saw in Christ. He saw in Christ, verse 6, he was in the form of God. He was in the form of God. And verse 7, he says, But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. He suffered the loss of himself as being in the form of God to, that make him, to make himself in the form of man. In other words, he left the throne of endless glory and became a baby in a, in a cradle in the dirt. And verse 8, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He made himself in that fashion as a man for the purpose of operating in obedience to the will of God, and the will of God, uh, as it was written of him, was to die. Now, <laughs> what's the result of him being that obedient? Verse 10 and 11. Read it. He got exalted. Now, the Apostle Paul saw that, and not only was he justified by that faith of Jesus Christ, he also could live that, that life by the faith of Jesus Christ. Amen. And press through the mark for the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus through that faith that was given to him. And Paul saw that and made a decision to set himself apart from who he was in the flesh so that he might attain unto that same resurrection and exaltation that Christ received of the Father. That's what he says in the next chapter. And the only way Paul could do that was by living through the faith of Jesus Christ that was revealed to him in the Scriptures. That's where the faith of Christ is revealed in the Scriptures. You've got to search them. You've got to figure out what they are. And once you figure out the faith of Christ, not only does it justify you, it gives you the wisdom on how to operate in this world and how to be obedient to the Father and how to make this decision in this place and what to do in this place. And that's what God's giving you. He's not leaving it up to yourself. He's not like, well, here, here's, a, here's a righteous law. Uh, are you going to do it or are you not? No, he's already given you everything you need to do in every single situation. you got to go and search the Scriptures and understand that it's the faith of Jesus Christ that you have to live your life by. All right. And him being found in him. Yeah. Yep. 
Proves the point, don't it? He wants to be found in that. He wants to be found in that, that exalted resurrection glory of Christ. Yep. That's the prize he's seeking to attain. Yep. <laughs> wow, man. That's good stuff, man. Anybody have any questions, comments, concerns? Yeah, but do you believe, because uh, I, I want to be talking about this stuff too, that Josh shall live by faith. And Paul, Paul says there in, in Romans about from faith to faith. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that, that from faith to faith is from the faith of Christ to us to yep. faith? So you have the faith in Romans 1 5 and the obedience of faith in Romans 16. So what's actually being what's actually being transferred to the believer is the faith of Christ through faith, and it's the faith of Christ being given by the Word of God mm -hmm. that enables us to live unto God. Yep. Yeah. You see it that way. Yeah. Not not only that, but there's a transfer. <coughs> like that's what I believe Paul means in Second Corinthians about from glory to glory. Yep. The transfer of glory from Christ to us. By the Spirit, that's that perfecting he's talking about in Galatians. Right yep. now, made perfect by the flesh. Wow, just keeps getting better. And better, better and better, <laughs> dude. I got um, look at John seven. I heard this nugget today. You see, Paul, Paul explains that a bit, like when he says at the end of Romans. Uh, Obedience of faith. Well, in Romans 10, he explained that obedience. They have not all obeyed the gospel. Yep. When Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed? So disobedience there is not believing. John 7, what? Uh, 37. A second. All right, I found it. All right. So John seven thirty seven says, In the last day of that great uh, day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. You might want to take a stab at where that's quoted. I know where it's quoted. Where? Look back in John 4. Look at 414. But whosoever drinketh the, uh, of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that, uh, that I shall give him... Christ is the scripture. He called himself the scripture. <laughs> Yeah. The scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Romans chapter 9, there was scripture saith, uh, the, the scripture foreseeing and preached. Yeah. Yeah. You're a bibliolater. Well, yeah. I got a biblical case to be, I guess. <laughs> but isn't that the theme, though, that he's the Word of God and in John, so he would call himself the scripture? Yeah. But uh, that goes along with the faith of Christ, too, because. He's calling himself the scripture. He was the manifestation of the word of God. So all that stuff you read in Proverbs is like, don't do this, don't do that. You have to operate this way. That's written from Solomon, the son of David, to his son, which would be Jesus Christ, who is the son of David. So Christ enacted all that wisdom in Proverbs. And the way he, he the re, well, he enacted all that wisdom and that stuff was imparted to us when we believed, when we trusted Jesus Christ. That's his faith. But yeah, I heard that nugget today because that, that verse is, it hasn't bothered me, but I knew that like, I had no idea where he was quoting from. So I was like, well, eventually I'll just figure it out. Yeah. And I heard Sam Gipp say it. He's like, no, that's one interpretation. I was like, no, that's the interpretation right there. Because that's the theme of John, the book of John anyway. All right, let's pray.
Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for everything you've done for us, Lord. Thank you for allowing us to come here and uh, worship you and uh, hear your words preached, Lord. And We just thank you for giving us this book, this King James Bible in our language, Lord. And we just thank you for uh, giving us the understanding that we possibly need to understand your, the deep truths of your word, Lord. And Thank you for allowing us to see your son's faith clearly revealed in the scriptures so that we could not only be justified by it, but also just live our life, our Christian life by it. Lord, we just thank you for <clears throat> everything you've done for us, Lord, everything you've enriched us with, Lord. And I pray that you would just allow us to have a good, safe rest of the night and a good, safe rest of the week and uh, allow us to come back on Sunday. I pray that everything was said and done today. And for the rest of the week, we'll be done in the, to the praise, honor, and glory of your Son's name, the Lord Jesus Christ. In His name I pray. Amen.